Well, good evening and uh, welcome to our evening service uh, and a warm welcome if you're watching online this evening as well. Uh, let us worship God then by singing to his praise in the Scottish Psalter in Psalm 92. Psalm 92 on page 352 and we'll sing the verses marked 1 to 6. <coughs> to render thanks unto the Lord it is a comely thing <coughs> and to thy name O thou most high to praise aloud to sing. Thy loving kindness to show forth when shines the morning light and to declare thy faithfulness with pleasure every night. And we'll sing to the verse marked five and six. How great, Lord, are thy works. Each thought of thine a deep it is. A brutish man that knoweth not. Fools understand not this. Let us sing these verses unto God's praise in Psalm 92 to render thanks unto the Lord. To render thanks unto thanks that we can come this evening to render thanks and uh, remember that it is uh, <coughs> a comely thing to sing praises to your name and we thank you that we are able to do this to join together on such a beautiful evening after the gift of rain that thou hast given us to come together to worship in your house and we thank you that we are to be found here, that you have put in our hearts the desire to come together to worship you, to meditate upon your word, and to be able to say, uh, if it be your will at the end, that it was good for us to have been here. 
<laughs> we thank you for all your blessings and your mercies to us. We thank you for uh, your word being put out this morning in so many parts of the world and still to be put out in so many parts of the world this evening as the day goes on from where the sun rises until the sun sets. Uh, that uh, you are present in all things. And we thank you, O Lord, that your word is preached and your name is praised <coughs> in so many parts, if not all parts of the world, that there is a presence uh, in every single country. And even although it may be hidden and deep underground in places like North Korea, nevertheless, there is a remnant of your people in all parts. We pray, O oh Lord, this evening uh, that uh, your suffering church would be uh, upheld, that it would be strengthened, uh, not as they say themselves that the persecution would be taken from them, but that they would be given the strength to uh, withstand, to uphold and to testify so that others may come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for those, so many, who put their lives in danger to bring your word to uh, different parts of the world. We remember also the work of the Bible translators, uh, wheresoever they are, struggling at times with difficulties of translation when there are no adequate words in those languages to translate some of the concepts uh, that occur in Scripture. Help us, O oh Lord, to appreciate the privilege that we have of having your word in our own languages and being able to come to it, being able to read it, being able to meditate upon it and to hear it preached upon and spoken about uh, among our fellowships uh, from time to time. And although our gathering together out with the church building are not what they used to be, nevertheless, your people still share uh, the testimony that is the word of God. And we thank you that they are able to do so, to witness for the finished work of Calvary, to witness uh, for the effect of the atonement in their lives, for the blood that was shed, and that they are uh, cleansed from sin. And although we come and admit freely that we sin daily in thought, word, and deed, no matter how hard we try, Nevertheless, you are a gracious God, a God who has poured out your grace upon your people. And we thank you that all these uh, <coughs> sins are wiped away by the blood of the Lamb. We thank you that he and even now intercedes for us as we were meditating this morning on the right hand of the Father. And we thank you uh, <coughs> that that is something that will continue until he comes again. And we thank you for the promise that the Lord Jesus Christ will come again. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would uh, help so many to come to a saving knowledge of you before that day comes or before they are taken into eternity and before their time on mercy's ground is too late. And we pray for young and old present this evening in your house, present <coughs> online, present in places of worship throughout our land, a land that has turned its back upon the principles of your word and pays scant attention to the things contained therein. How sad it is that a land that was known as the land of the book that sent out your word and missionaries and others uh, to so many parts of the world is now no longer regarded even as a Christian country. We pray, O oh Lord, <coughs> that you would uh, reverse that we pray for a pouring out of your spirit, for times of refreshing, for times of revival once again. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down in power as you have done before, even here in our own island and throughout our land, that we might see days again <clears throat> and hear days of refreshing again and hear the voice of the turtle dove in our land. We thank you that there are still uh, people coming to a saving knowledge, especially among the young. And we thank you, O oh Lord, for the work of the Free Church camps and so many other camps and conferences that take place uh, through the auspices of various uh, evangelical associations. 
We pray for the camps this week in Oswestry and elsewhere, and the camps to come in Kincraig and Renfrew. And uh, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless those who give up freely of their own time to be part of that. We pray that you would bless the efforts that are made among them. Bless this congregation. Bless the minister and his family. Be with him in grand times of refreshing as he takes a, a well-merited holiday at this time. And we pray for those who are away from the congregation uh, this evening, who may be on holiday or who may be uh, with work commitments involved in other places. We remember those watching on online who are unable to be present in your house, and yet their heart is here among your people as they join <coughs> in the evening worship. And that has been your command uh, ever since the uh, establishment of you, the tabernacle, morning and evening worship. And we thank you that that is the case still here, although many places no longer have or are able to have an evening worship. We pray, O oh Lord, for uh, a reversal of these things. We remember the elders and deacons of the congregation and all those who work in all the various other, other activities that go on. And we pray for your blessing upon them. We pray, O oh Lord, uh, that you would bless your word uh, in the wider church. We remember your persecuted church this evening, particularly in parts of Africa, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, in North Korea, in China. So many places... Uh, where your people are persecuted, some even unto death. But we thank you, O Lord, that we hear encouraging things coming from so many parts of the world, uh, particularly from the United States and from Latin America, where uh, there are times of refreshing and times of revival going on. We pray for your church in Australia and New Zealand in the Pacific. There are so many places, O Lord, that we forget to pray for. And yet you know each and every one of them. And you know exactly what is going on in these places. Indeed, you have foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. And we thank you for that, that you are the sovereign God, that you uphold all things by the power of your hands. Be with us this evening as we come once again to meditate on a portion of your work. Grant your blessing upon it. Uh, that we would feel the unction of the Holy Spirit among us, moving among us, moving among the people. Uh, and each one of us would be able to say that it was good to have been here. <coughs> Where two or three are gathered in your name, you have promised that you will be there. Be with us now as we continue uh, <coughs> uh, our worship and, uh, to, and uh, meditate upon your word and pardon sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Sing again then in Psalm 139 in the Scottish Psalter. Psalm 139. And we'll sing uh, <coughs> the verses marked 1 to 10 it's on page 432. O Lord, thou hast me searched and known, thou knowest my sitting down and rising up, yea, all my thoughts afar to thee are known. My footsteps and my lying down thou compassest all ways. Thou also most entirely art acquaint with all my ways. And we'll sing down to the verses Mark 9 and 10. Take I the morning wings and dwell in utmost parts of sea. Even there, Lord, shall thy hand me lead. Thy right hand hold shall me. And our next singing will be the following verses of this psalm as well. Psalm 139, O Lord, thou hast me searched unknown. O Lord, thou hast me searched unknown, thou knowest my sitting down, and rising up. My 
word then as we find it in the New Testament in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians and chapter 2. The first letter of the Corinthians and chapter 2. We shall read the whole chapter. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory, None of the rulers of the age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depth of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural man, the natural person, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness or folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen, and may the Lord bless to us uh, that reading of his holy and infallible word, and to his name be the praise. Let's sing again then in the same psalm, Psalm 139. We'll sing from verses 11 down to the verse marked uh, 16. 
If I do say that darkness shall me cover from thy sight, then surely shall the very night about me be as light. Yea, darkness hideth not from thee, but night does shine as day. To thee the darkness and the light are both alike alway. And we'll sing down to the first part of uh, verse 16. Thine eyes my substance did behold, yet being unperfect. And in the volume of thy book my members all were writ. Let's sing these verses and to God's praise, if I do say that darkness shall. If I do chapter that we read, the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 2, and we can read again at verse 9. <clears throat> but as it is written, what no eye hath seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depth of God, or as it is in the AV, the deep things of God. The Spirit searches everything, even the deep things of God. <laughs> this letter then to the Corinthian church that Paul writes from Ephesus, <coughs> 
probably somewhere between 55 to 57 AD, was five years after Paul had left Corinth. Now, if you go back to Acts 18, you will find there Paul's visit in Corinth. When he left uh, Athens, as it says in Acts 18, verse 1, uh, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And there he reasoned, verse 4 says, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, persuading Jews and Greeks. And later on, we find further down, uh, many of the in verse 8, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many people in this city, or I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. <clears throat> so effectively, there was an 18-month ministry or an 18-month stay in Corinth. Paul then moves on from there, having established the church, and the letter that he is writing now is approximately five years later. And as we find out in uh, chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, uh, two have come, two or three have come with him in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 17. We find, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaius because they have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. And they're the ones who have brought Paul news of what is going on in the church in Corinth since he last was there. And when you read through the letter to the Corinthians, it's not a pretty picture. It's not a pretty picture. You go back just to the first chapter and what we find is that there are arguments and divisions in the church. In chapter 1 and verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's peoples that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, Peter, or I follow Christ. And then this great statement, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And so on. And later on, we find in chapter 3, uh, further divisions in the church. Then we find that there are problems with the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And so it would seem that the Corinthian church has become a little bit of a mess since Paul left. Now perhaps that's a harsh judgment, but Paul himself is quite harsh about it. And in order to understand much of this, we need to understand uh, a little bit about the background of the city of Corinth and what the situation was. Next to Athens, Corinth was the most important city in Greece at the time. There are some historians who think it was even more important <coughs> than Athens itself. It was a trade centre, but it was also the centre of the worship of many of the Greek gods. And it was a centre of learning, if you want to think of it as a university town. Uh, it was a centre of philosophy, it was a, a centre of learning of mathematics and science and various other things. And much of the letters to the Corinthians paint for us a picture of what is going on in the church at Corinth. And this is why Paul says at the beginning of chapter 2, when I came to you I did not come proclaiming the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Because it's not about eloquence. 
words. <coughs> the pulpit is not about eloquence. Eloquence, of course, is useful. It's a tool like so many other tools. And if a preacher is eloquent, then his, mercy, his message may be slightly <coughs> more effective. But it doesn't matter how eloquent he is. His message will have no effect whatsoever unless the Holy Spirit is working within the congregation of listeners. It may well be that we find some preachers more interesting and more entertaining than others. And perhaps it's a sad reflection on the state of the church throughout Great Britain that in many churches it's the entertainment value that matters far more than the word of God. I don't know if I was telling you that uh, a couple of years ago I was on the mainland <coughs> uh, and I happened to visit a church that I wanted to visit very much. Not because of the preaching, but because of the building. It was a church in which in 1608, the decree was signed by King James to begin the work of the uh, translation of the authorised version of the Bible. I don't know if many of you know where it is. It's in Burnt Island in Fife. It's a square church. It's a fascinating church to go into. Uh, if you're ever down in that neck of the woods uh, to go and actually visit it, uh, it's uh, quite an amazing church to see because it harks back to the days of the 17th century in its building and its style. And there were seats that we were shown round the church after, after the Sunday morning service uh, by one of the elders and he said, he showed to me, these were the seats, he said, where the shepherds sat. And you see how wide the seats are because they had permission to bring their dogs and their dogs could sit at their feet. And upstairs there was a special door outside that connected directly to the outside. And that was where the fishermen sat because they smelled so much that they sat far away from the rest of the congregation and so on. And it was quite a fascinating building. But I have never been so disappointed by a sermon in my life. All I heard was a sermon about climate change and global warming. The word of God was simply not preached at all. And is it little wonder that in so many of the churches throughout our land that we see no movement of the Spirit because the word of God is not being preached. That is not the case on our island as far as I am aware or throughout our denomination. We may have different opinions about preachers, etc., that's neither here nor there. That's a different thing altogether. <coughs> but when the word of God is not being preached, we cannot expect a blessing to follow it. And therefore Paul points out that this eloquence is not what matters. And he says in verse 3, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and in po of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, that is, of course, what matters, that our faith rests in the power of God. But nevertheless, he goes on, among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Now, what does he mean by the mature? It's not necessarily mature in terms of age, but mature spiritually. And there are many young people that I am familiar with who are, excuse me, who are quite mature spiritually, and of course vice versa as well. And then he says, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. What's the use of the word glory there? We were meditating a little bit this morning on the different uses of the word glory. What's the meaning of glory? Because we see that in the next verse, in verse 8 at the end, if the rulers of the age had understood this, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. 
the two things, the, the word glory does not mean the same thing in both places. And I'll leave that for you for your homework to think out what is the difference of meaning. There are so many times that the word glory is used in Scripture and yet so many different meanings that it has. And it's worth, it's a very interesting study to do. If you look up the concordance and see how many times the word glory appears, it'll take you a few days to look up all the references. So I'll leave that as a task for you because I don't really have time to go into it this evening. <clears throat> and he has declared then that there is a secret and hidden wisdom which is put imparted, he says, by the apostles. And that secret and hidden wisdom has been written by them in their letters. As you go through the letters of the apostles, not just Paul, but James, Peter, John, and so on, you will find many things that are the secret and hidden wisdom of God. And you notice towards the end of the chapter that he says something very interesting as well. In verse 13, we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spirit. Why? Because the natural person does not accept or does not understand that it is in the A.B., the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly, it says here, the A.B. says foolishness to him. The natural man is unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Now that might seem obvious to us in one sense. But yet, when we come to the believers, to you and I this evening, to meditate on the things which are spiritually discerned, Paul tells us in verse 10, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God, as it is here, or as it is in the A.B., the deep things of God. And I want to consider for a wee while with you this evening, what are the deep things of God? And you might think, oh dear, you know, this is something that I'm not going to understand. Don't worry. There are things in the deep things of God that I have no understanding of whatsoever. And that every minister and every preacher will admit immediately, and your elders and your deacons and others will admit, I just don't understand that. I'll give you one very simple example. When I say it's a simple example, it's not really. But nevertheless, it will suffice. How do you understand the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you ever thought about that? Even although the promise was made in Genesis that through the seed of the woman, notice, not the seed of the man. We know that biologically nowadays it's through the seed of the man, of course, that fertilizes the egg that a pregnancy is produced. But what's called the proto Evangelio, the, the early gospel in Genesis 3.16, if I remember correctly, or somewhere around there, that says this, the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. And when you come to see the fulfillment of that in the, in the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ, how did Mary become pregnant? Now, there are many people who, as soon as you ask that question, of course, simply scoff and say, it's impossible. Couldn't have happened the way that Scripture described it, that the Holy Spirit would overshadow her. But you remember that Mary's own question, the answer was, <coughs> with God, nothing is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. And why should it be? This is the creator. This is the one who sustains the world. 
by his power, why should we think that it would be impossible for such a conception to take place? To say that we don't understand it, that's a different thing altogether. I don't understand how it took place. But I believe that it did take place, and that is where faith comes in over logic and reason. You see, if we could understand everything in Scripture by logic and reason, we would have no need of faith at all. There are so many things that we believe simply by faith, and that's one of them. But that in itself is not really one of the deep things of God. Much, much deeper. are the things that God has revealed to us in his book of words. God has provided us with two books. There's what's called the book of words, which is the Bible, and his book of works, which is creation and nature round about us. And it's a useful acronym to remember. What does Bible stand for? Well, in the first place, it's basic instructions before leaving earth. I'm sure you've heard that before. That's what the Bible is all about. Basic instructions before leaving earth. But secondly, when we look at God's book of works, creation round about us, we can say that it's basic instructions by living earth. Because you cannot but observe in nature itself the glory of God made manifest. Things that we can't even put into words. I remember teaching an ethics class at one time and we were on a philosophical question of knowledge of how do I know what I know? And how do I know that what I know is true? And I said, <clears throat> okay, here's a very simple problem for you. All of you know what coffee is. Describe the taste of coffee. Not a single 18 year old in the class would, class of 30 odd, would attempt to describe the taste of coffee. Some of them muttered things like, well, it's bitter, it's brown, <coughs> brown is not a taste, etc. and so on. And they got tangled up immediately in concepts. And yet everybody knows. I mean, the simple thing is, you want to know what coffee tastes like? Taste it. Or another example, the smell of a rose. How can you describe the smell of a rose? Stick your nose in it, that's the simplest way, and you'll know immediately what it smells like. And so on. But these are things that we gain knowledge by experience from. But there are other, there's a different level of knowledge, which is spiritual knowledge that is taught to us by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. And this is why you and I should be studying the Word of God every single day. I know, and so many people say it's so difficult, I don't find time to do it. Well, it's a discipline like everything else. You make time. You make time. Get up ten minutes earlier. Or go to bed ten minutes later. And give yourself time simply to read the Word of God. To saturate yourself in the Word of God. Because the more you read the Word of God, the more the Spirit will open it up to you. And I'm sure everyone who's a Christian believer here will have had the experience of reading verses or a chapter at times and at one time said nothing to you, got absolutely nothing out of it. And you're back at it later, some time later, and it's full of hidden meaning in life. And it's just as if someone had turned a light on and shone it on for you. What is that? That, of course, is the work of the Spirit. The Spirit opens to you as you have need. And every believer is at a different stage in the process of sanctification. And as he is, 
the Spirit ministers according to his needs. As Paul puts it, you started off being fed with the milk of the Word. But you have to come to a stage. Again, in the parallels between the human being, that's why we sang Psalm 139. You start off with milk at your mother's breast. But there comes, you have to move on to solid food. And you have to move on to meat. And Paul uses that image as he goes on. And the first question that many people ask about the deep things of God, is they, they say, well, what is God like? Describe God. And for someone who has no knowledge of scripture, never went to a church, wasn't brought up in a church, when they ask a question like that, how would you answer? Describe God. That's why in so many periods of history, the church fathers produced... <coughs> catechisms and the shorter catechism of course that we were so familiar with is a wonderful help like that it was common when uh, <coughs> Christianity came to Lewis and moved on later on in the 17th and 18th century that catechists were employed by the church and they went round the houses teaching people from the catechism and questioning them to see whether they had learnt the answers. That used to be so common in Sabbath schools and even in the day school. I remember as a child <coughs> having to memorize the whole catechism. And the only reason you really wanted to do it and be perfect in it was because you got a prize if you managed to do it all at the end. But nevertheless, the catechism is an extremely useful tool. And if you go back to the Westminster Divines, when they wrote the Westminster Confession of Faith, go back in church history to the various councils that took place, to the Council of Nicaea in 325, to the Anastasian Creed later on, where you find the church fathers attempting to put in simple words the things that the believer and the church had to understand. And the Catechism opens for us in question four. Simple question, what is God? I wonder how many of us could repeat the answer from memory now. I couldn't. I've forgotten it. But it's good to come back to it. God is a spirit, it says. Infinite, eternal and unchangeable. In his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness and truth. These are what we call the attributes of God, the characteristics of God. How do you understand these apparently simple words? Think even of the word eternal. You and I, our concept of eternity is looking forward from time. It's relative to time now looking forward. But try looking backwards. How do you understand eternity that had no beginning and has no end? It's something we just cannot get our head around. We are beings who are constrained by time. The clock dominates our lives. It's sad really in a way, but that's the way it is. The clock <laughs> dominates our lives. And we know that our lives from birth to the grave will be a process of maximum maybe a hundred years if we're lucky. Perhaps uh, a lot less for the majority. Eternity. Have you ever meditated on what eternity means? There's no answer to it. We just don't know. We are told, of course, in scripture various things about eternity. What eternity will be like for the believer. To be present in the glory of God. The book of uh, Revelation opens that up to us in great detail. In the visions that John saw. It also opens up to us what will happen to those who are not believers. 
the great white throne of judgment. You see, it's so sad nowadays, and I often think of this as I listen to the news and particularly the comments when someone has died tragically, etc., or so on, or whatever. They were all wonderful people when they were alive. And there seems to be this belief, if I can put it this way, that everyone who dies goes to heaven. That is not what scripture teaches. Not at all. Not at all. I suppose it is comforting, in a sense, to think that. But it's not the truth. It's not the truth at all. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. And here it's very often the critics jump in and say, oh, how, how, how do you, what do you mean God is unchangeable? Immutable is the word that's used. We read several times in the Old Testament that God changed his mind. You remember in his arguments with, uh, or in Abraham's arguments with him, it was as if Abraham was persuading God to change his mind. But that is misunderstanding another of God's attributes. God's omniscience meaning that he knows everything. He is omniscient, omni is the Latin word for all, omniscient and omnipresent, present in all places at the same time. Can you get your head round that? I can't. I believe it though. I believe that God is present here through the Holy Spirit in this group of believers in the same way as he's present in every church on our island and throughout our land this evening. And indeed throughout the whole world, through the Holy Spirit. We were speaking a little about that this morning. And then we come into the fact that he has foreordained everything that comes to pass. And how many of the uh, skeptics will then say to us, well, that means we're just little robots wandering around. If everything has been foreordained, or as some would use the term predestined by God to take place, then you and I are just like little clockwork oranges moving around throughout time and space until we come to our final end. That's not the case at all. There is a great difference between the omniscience of God, God knowing everything that we will do, and the way that we can understand it. How often as parents, for example, do we say to our children, I'm not going to give you this present unless you behave properly, unless you do such and such knowing fine well that you'll give it to them anyway. But they don't know that. You see, <coughs> man's responsibility, and this is what we see in Adam and Eve in the garden. They had complete free will in the garden. And yet, what happened? <coughs> they, Eve, was deceived Adam made the choice. Adam made the choice. And each and every one of us have a responsibility to come to seek out the deep things of God. You can't stand at the throne of judgment on judgment day and say to God, ah, it was your fault because you didn't predestine me to come to faith. That brings us, of course, into the whole subject of election, which is an even more difficult topic. So many people reject the topic of election. And yet, election is so clearly shown through Scripture from the very beginning. God chooses a people. 
perhaps the best advice that one can be given on election. I may have said this before, I probably did. And it might sound a little bit rude. Perhaps it is rude, but I don't care. It's none of your business. It's as simple as that. Election is none of your business. It's God's business. It is God who elects. Your responsibility is to seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. That is your responsibility. And if in your responsibility you simply make an excuse and say, well, you know, if it comes, it'll come, etc. Then why should you be surprised if it doesn't come? that you seek the Lord with your whole heart. With your whole heart. Oh, there are many who say, oh, I believe, but I believe scripture. I believe what the Bible says. I believe everything that's in it. But they haven't come to faith. Why? Because they have not acknowledged <coughs> the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They have not understood that they are sinners, or not admitted perhaps, that they are sinners in need of salvation. So many deep things. Which one of us understands regeneration by the blood of the Lamb? Washed from your sins, past, present, and future. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. That's what scripture tells us in the, in the prophecy of Isaiah. And doesn't God, doesn't God say, even through Isaiah, look unto me, all ends of the earth, and be ye saved. Come, let us reason together, he says in another part. Or oh, you don't come to it by reason. But you understand by reason that you need to come. There's the difference. <coughs> you understand by reason as you study scripture that you need a saviour. The time has gone by. How do we meditate, for example, on God's holiness? The only attribute of God that's mentioned three times. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Isaiah 6, and again the song that we see in Revelation. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. All the other attributes of God are mentioned throughout Scripture, but never, <coughs> never thrice together. And you and I have some concept, perhaps, of what holiness actually means. We think that holiness very often means being a better person. And one of the first things, and I'm sure so many of you will remember this, when the Spirit was struggling with you to come to faith, that one of the first things you did was you tried to be a better person. But you found it impossible. Because it's not through your own efforts that you become holy. And no matter how much you try in this life, you will never be holy. Never be holy. That's why so many people say, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough to come and be a member and to sit at the Lord's table. No, you're not. And you never will be. You never will be. It is only through the blood of the Lamb that cleanses from all sin, that any of us are able to do these things. You will not be fully sanctified, made holy, until you pass into eternity. That in itself is a mystery. How is it that at the moment of death, the soul is fully sanctified? Fully sanctified. The soul that is so full of corruption and sin in this life. And yet, in the blink of an eye, becomes fully sanctified. That's an amazing mystery as well. I don't have time to go into to God's justice. 
how we see God's justice applied. That's what we see on the cross. God's perfect justice being applied to a perfect victim in a perfect way so that you and I may be made perfect in holiness. That's what God's justice is all about. And the sword of God's justice is seen at the Garden of Eden, at the gates, stopping Adam and Eve from returning in there again as they are driven out. Thorns and thistles the ground would bring forth for them. And that is, of course, why Christ is crowned with a crown of thorns as he is led to the cross. The thorns represent the sin that Christ is uh, crowned with. And finally, I'll close with this. Uh, the time has gone past. We hear so much about God's love. That's one of the things that so many people like to talk about. How can a loving God send anyone to hell? Question we hear so frequently. Oh, it's not God who sends you to hell. It's you yourself. You have rejected the offer of the gospel. You've heard it. I don't know. Scripture doesn't make it clear to us how God deals with those who have never heard the offer of the gospel. But that is not your excuse this evening. You have heard the gospel proclaimed freely to you. And if you reject the offer of the gospel, then God's love is replaced by God's justice and God's anger. And all you have to do is to see that process unfolding throughout the world even at this present time that's what the four horsemen of the apocalypse are all about in the vision that John has given what does he see he sees the rider on the white horse the Lord Jesus Christ going forth the word of God going forth throughout the world and wherever it does go, wherever it goes, it is followed immediately by the red horse. What is the red horse? It's war, persecution. Wherever the gospel goes, persecution follows. And what follows in its wake? The black horse, with the pair of scales in its hand. And the scales are the balances that show how the inflation, the prices have risen so much in what he says. What does it signify? It signifies poverty. And all we have to do is look throughout our world to see that so clearly. Poverty. And the final rider needs no explanation. The rider on the pale horse. Death follows all these things. That is the process of life and death throughout time in this present world. But aren't you thankful that the Lord Jesus Christ will come again and has triumphed over all these things? That his word still goes forth with power. That it still reaches sinners and brings them to see their need for salvation. <coughs> and the Lord's people rest on these promises, knowing that whatever happens round about them, they can safely say, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And with that, I am fully satisfied. Let us pray. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we can meditate on some of these things, even although we simply scratch the surface of many of the deep things that take place in the mystery of your word and in the mystery of creation. 
But we thank you that you open these things up to us through your Holy Spirit. We pray, O Lord, that you would bless any here this evening who are struggling to understand these things, that they would turn to your word and be led by your Spirit to come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that he is the one who still calls sinners to come unto himself and that he has promised to comfort us the Holy Spirit, and when he comes, that he will teach us all things that we have need of. We thank you for that. Be with us this evening as we conclude our worship and pardon sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Let us conclude then by singing in Psalm 92, at verse 12, on page 353 in the blue book, Psalm 92, but like the palm tree flourishing shall be the righteous one. He shall like to the cedar grow that is in Lebanon. And these such wonderful words in the psalm. Those that within the house of God are planted by his grace. We didn't have time to speak even about grace at all this evening. Remember the acronym from grace, gift received at Christ's expense. That's what grace is what you are given at Christ's gift, a free gift at Christ's expense. Those that within the house of God are planted by his grace, they shall grow up and flourish all in our God's holy place. And in old age, when others fade, they fruit still forth shall bring. They shall be fat and full of sap, and a be flourishing. Why? To show that upright is the Lord. He is a rock to me, and he from all unrighteousness is altogether free. Let us sing these verses then in conclusion. Psalm 92 at verse 12, but like the palm tree flourishing. But like the palm tree flourishing shall be the righteous one. He shall Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.